talking about a research line that I started a handful of years ago. And it's looking at academic demands, namely homework, and the impact, uh, any impact socially, emotionally, on uh, children. And today I'm gonna to be focusing on the research that I'm doing that primarily involves uh, children grades uh, three to six, and then I'll talk also about some future directions for my research. And also just a few thoughts and tips for you all. I know that everyone in this room somehow is going to be either an educator or an advocate for children. And so I'm gonna leave everyone today with just a few tips that you can take away that uh, perhaps you can even start to think about or use starting tomorrow in your work with kids. So today we're gonna talk about just a real brief history and everything's gonna be incredibly brief today because I'm, I'm given a very limited amount of time. So um, as I was mentioning to the Dean, if I start to um, speed up like an auctioneer toward the end of my time, I just wanna get everything in. Um, but we're going to talk about a brief history and research behind academic demands, namely homework. Um, we're going to talk about my current research that I'm conducting with my um, team of graduate students, and I have an undergraduate also that's on my uh, research team, and then also future directions and tips for you all. So very briefly, um, the history and research behind homework and <laughs> academic demands Prior to the 20th century, uh, it was really uh, pro, pro homework. It was thought to create discipline for the young mind. And so uh, students were being assigned various amounts of homework. In the early 1900s, um, there was a movement against homework. Uh, emphasis uh, more on problem solving over drills, and it was really seen as an intrusion on family time. Well then, the launch of Sputnik happened, and the United States uh, decided we need more rigor in our academics, and so there was once again a, a pro-homework push. And then around the 60s and 70s, um, like once again, it was seen both on a, as an intrusion on family time and also having some impact on children's ability to um, be free and playful and have that um, good social emotional health. <clears throat> then in the 1980s, we started seeing declining test scores compared to other uh, nations. And so once again, it came back on the scene. And today there's a bit of a mixed opinion and I'm gonna share with you briefly some research uh, creating that mixed opinion. So the last two decades, and just by a show of hands, how many educators are in the room right now or work with students out in the schools. Have you noticed an increasing um, trend of creating the super student? Um, particularly in the high school years, and I've seen that push down even into the middle school years. Um, I think there's various reasons for that. The No Child Left Behind Act kicked that off, standardized test scores, and now the teachers, uh, bonuses and such, and even sometimes job security being linked to uh, what score the, the school overall gets on these standardized test scores has created a lot of pressure. And that pressure is very real. And I think one way that schools have uh, tried to accommodate for that is to assign more homework. Um, college entrance requirements. Uh, this was not my experience going to college. And now uh, getting into college is, um, incredibly rigorous in the entrance requirements. Um, it's, it's like almost going through the eye of the needle um, to get into some of these schools. So there is this increasing demand on students to be what we call super students. And now students aren't only required to have a certain GPA, but they're also required to be involved in lots of extracurriculars. In addition to that, we need tutoring services in order for students to be in APs, which look really good for colleges. Um, they also have service requirements now, and this is kind of across the board. It used to be just more in your high-flying um, programs where there was a service requirement. Now community service is more of the norm as opposed to the exception. Um, I've also noticed lately humanities and cultural event requirements. Um, I, in addition to being a school psychologist, I'm also a clinical psychologist, and so I have a a uh, very part-time private practice in downtown Sacramento where I see uh, children's teens and families. 
And uh, what I've noticed is, is over the last several decades that I've been in private practice, this increasing pressure on students to be super students, and a lot of them have been talking about now their humanities requirement, where on top of their increased homework and other requirements as a student, they have to attend more cultural events a quarter, um, and to, again, give back to their community in some uh, verifiable way. So, I just have a few notes. My students who know me know I can't go through an entire uh, workshop without having a few comics. Says, Mommy, I've got so uh, many pounds of homework tonight, I'm already exhausted just from the backpack home. I, I remember being at an um, elementary school where they were talking about just the increasing uh, rigor and academic demands and the homework going back and forth from school to home. And the fact that the little backs, you know, just even the, the medical profession is weighed in on this of, of how much weight that a little child can actually carry. And so the school's recommendation was, well, we need to start roller bags. As opposed to, we really probably ought to be looking at what, <laughs> what we're doing here with, with these kids. So in looking at just some of the meta-analyses, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but there has, have been a lot of um, analyses looking at homework and um, achievement. And with regard to these meta-analyses, where they take lots of research and um, uh, look, look at overall the uh, data from many, many multiple studies, uh, what has been found with regard to research and achievement, they, they uh, qualify achievement as GPA, uh, performance on standardized test scores, along with portfolios for schools that, that use portfolios. So they looked at all uh, a variety of different indicators. Uh, what they found that there is a, a, a correlation in the upper grades of 0.25, um, which for those of you that, that know stats isn't um, overwhelming <laughs> correlation. Uh, and, it, and it's really dependent on subject. In the lower grades, meaning K to three or K to two, there was actually a, a very slight negative correlation. But the more homework that you assign to, let's say, a kindergartner, sometimes the, the, the performance actually uh, goes down as opposed to boosters. <coughs> um, other studies concur high school about 0.25, middle school about 0.07, and elementary school uh, not, not much of a uh, relationship seen. The amount also matters in high school. Uh, the relationship between homework and achievement didn't really appear until about an hour of homework. So really actually that sweet spot is around an hour to two hours. Two hours seems to be the tipping point. When, when students come home with three to four hours of homework, once again we see that that's where the relationship between <coughs> academic achievement, success, and uh, amount of homework begins to drop off. Um, middle school, uh, it's about an hour. Um, that's where the relationship is the highest. And then in elementary school, uh, there, there just isn't much of a relationship that's been found. So the type matters, uh, matters as well. Uh, there was a recent uh, study uh, a few years back wherein math homework of approximately 15 minutes per night did increase standardized test scores. Um, but in other subjects, not so much. But what has been consistent across all studies, free reading. Having students engage in free reading, um, pleasure reading, um, you know, assigned reading, and then coming into class and analyzing that, that's been pretty consistently supported across the board in, in all studies. So here's Monday, he has a little homework. Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, looks like he's gonna go off to uh, one of uh, Dr. Brock's, uh, you know, hiking trips for a few weeks. <laughs> and the mom asks, do you have much homework this weekend, Jeremy? And he says, some. <laughs> so we also know, particularly with middle schoolers and high school schoolers, that there is evidence linking increased academic demands, namely homework, with some impact on social and emotional health. So for these students that have, let's say, four hours of homework a night, on top of an already rigorous school day, on top of their extracurriculars, community service, and humanities requirements, that, that actually the, the, the more homework that is given creates uh, some anxiety, which I think we can all imagine. 
um, because there are only so many hours a day, and we're going to talk about that in just a bit. There, there isn't a lot of information out there, though, for elementary age students um, with regard to research and looking at social and emotional health and academic demands. Um, we, we just know anecdotal reports, and I know anecdotal reports, again, from uh, my, my practice and, and what I do. We do know, uh, with regard to teens, um, that these factors have been worn out for those students that seem to have more negative impact on their social and emotional health, that stress creates um, illness uh, for those students that I have out there. Have you ever noticed the trend when you're doing that final push and you're moving up towards uh, the holiday break, the winter break? Have you ever noticed where you where you move through, you're, you're, you're pushing through, you have the last year finals, the last year papers in, and, and you're staying up late, and then what happens sometimes on day one of that break? <clears throat> <laughs> That's right. There's actually physiological reason for that. I, I won't go into all of that today, but there's actually, uh, at, at the cellular level, reason for why you get sick, but all of your resources have been moving towards um, keeping up with the demand, and, and once the demand is gone, um, your, your body is in that recovery mode, and it, it actually uh, impacts your immune system. Um, anxiety, uh, part of uh, my practice is I treat anxiety and depression uh, for children and teens, um, and I have to say over the years, I have been seeing an uptick in the trend of referrals. Um, for students and uh, the level of anxiety that they're experiencing as well, ranging from mild anxiety to um, all the way up to panic disorder, panic attacks. Sleep deprivation. By a show of hands, has anyone stayed up late to finish homework? <laughs> uh, we also know that cheating is on the rise for uh, you know our high school students in particular. Um, unfortunately, disengagement and dropping out, um, drug, alcohol abuse, and depression and suicide. Um, who, who really does a lot of work uh, around this topic is Vicki Ableis. I'm going to have a link to her work um, and her documentaries at the end of our time. And she looks a lot at um, the impact of academic demands and, and that that it has on the social and emotional health, primarily of uh, high schoolers. <coughs> So I also wanted to just touch upon um, academic de demands and equity. Um, there are fewer resources for students who are socioeconomically disadvantaged. Um, family support, sometimes um, you know, it's a single parent home or, or both parents there, but both have to work and work late. Um, the ability to afford some of the materials. I know my kids come home and Say, we have to go to the store tonight, Mom. I need this, this, and this to make a mechanical hand. And I'm like, oh my God, driving out to Home Depot at 8 o'clock at night. And I'm just thinking about what about the what about the, the family that can't afford the resources or don't have the transportation? What about the uh, group projects where students all have to get together somewhere to work on something over the weekend? Um, how does that always pan out for, for perhaps the family that doesn't have that ability to um, navigate that trip. I, I would suggest that this perhaps also for the widens the achievement gap. And this little girl's looking up at her mom and she says, thanks, but my homework is a little beyond your skill set, mom. <laughs> so for those of you on my research team, Mackenzie, Sam, Allison, Danielle, Vicki, Melissa, Christina, Diana, Lydia, and James, could you please stand up? That are here. I started off with a couple students and then I slowly over the years I just keep building. Um, I think that uh, I, I'm just so lucky and so fortunate. I work with a dynamic uh, group of students who are really invested in this topic. And in addition to doing lots of hard work together, I think that we're all pretty supportive of each other. We like to have fun together. Here's just a few pictures of some of our recent meetings together, um, you know, working hard on, on the project. Um, just a few other pictures of, again, some of the research team um, doing some data analysis in real time together. 
Um, and now I have four students that have uh, either graduated with their, this is their thesis topic, or um, are moving through their thesis right now with this project as their thesis topic. So very proud of them, and um, they're, they're going on to be very successful. So let's talk a little bit about the research. The purpose is to investigate the social and emotional health of elementary students in relationship to namely uh, the uh, assignment of homework. Uh, we developed uh, questionnaire surveys to look at parent, teacher, and student perspectives. So again, this is perspective research. But looking at um, perception on its effect on the student's social and emotional health. We also look at the effects of homework on non-academic um, interests such as play, uh, sports, and family as well, family time. So our surveys determine, again, parent, child, and teacher perception of homework. <coughs> we look at amount assigned. So we were interested in that because we were wondering if the teacher assigns, thinks she's assigning or he's assigning 20 minutes, does that really equate out to the parent and the student perception of how much homework is actually coming home? And I can know just anecdotally from my own experience with my own kids in my house, something that they swore that to the, their, my teacher said it would only take a half hour and we're up late at night trying to pull everything together for uh, this assignment. So we wanted to look at amount assigned completion time and also the utility. We can, what are the factors that are uh, behind assigning homework? Um, what, what is the utility of that? Um, and getting that perception as well. We wanted to look at any barriers, perhaps, that were there for um, successful completion, such as perhaps learning challenges, um, family dynamics, maybe um, you know, a child goes home and is a caretaker, perhaps, for a, a younger sibling, um, extracurricular activities, and then any social and emotional effects. And finally, we do have a question on there on the uh, parent and child uh, survey to look at uh, persistence to see if that has any relationship to homework completion as well. So our research questions, uh, we have many, I'm just <laughs> show, showcasing a few, but is there a relationship between homework and perceived social and emotional factors for children? And we also threw sleep in there too to look at any impact on um, the, the quality or duration of sleep. Is there agreement between raters amongst the perceptions of the amount and the purpose of homework? Does persistence correlate with homework completion? And are there differences uh, between ratings for schools that have more of a concrete homework policy and schools that don't? So again, we targeted children grades three to six. Um, so far we have uh, uh, close to 900 um, in our sample and, we're, and that's continuing to grow. Uh, we just got uh, full approval again to continue to collect data for this whole academic year in San Juan Unified. Um, so we're excited about that. Um, I Just real briefly, the grade and gender uh, breakdown of our sample, it's pretty even across grades <coughs> three to six, um, and, and uh, a few more girls than boys, but fairly even on gender. Uh, looked at the ethnicity um, of our sample. The reason why this totals more than 100% with regard to our percentages is because uh, parents were allowed to mark more than one um, ethnic category. So I highlighted in red a few areas that I wanted to draw your attention to because there, right now we have so much data. <laughs> Um, with so many variables that it's really exciting work, but I just wanted to highlight a few key areas. Um, first of all, uh, we asked parents and teachers if there was a homework policy at their school, and we got really interesting um, results from that. Um, about 32% of parents said yes, about 13% said no, and about 52% didn't know. Uh, for teachers, about 53% said yes, about 21% no, and about 21% they didn't know if there was a homework policy. And actually at all of the schools that we've looked at thus far, only one has a homework policy out of all of them. So um, actually the, the folks that did put yes, um, that, that wasn't quite 
on target and the homework policy that is available for the one school that we looked at that does have a policy is at just two paragraphs long and it doesn't uh, give um, some of the variables that I would think would be included in a more quality homework policy, such as do you give homework over the weekends or over breaks or how much homework and how much per grade, the, those things are not delineated in that homework policy. Um, looking at perceived effect, here's where we just asked a question. If, if homework has any impact on students' social and emotional health, um, for parents, um, they said that about 26% felt that homework had a positive effect on students' social and emotional health. About 14.5% felt it, it had a negative effect. And about 46% uh, felt that it had no effect, no impact on social and emotional health. That compared to the teacher data I thought was interesting. Um, the teacher data, about 32% felt it was positive and the rest felt no effect. None, none of the teachers felt that there would be any negative impact at all to the social and emotional health of children with regard to homework assignment. So as you can already see, there's a little disconnect between home and school. Um, with regard to, uh, with, now this is parents um, determining out of these various uh, variables what um, feelings come up for their student for their child as they're working on homework. Um, about 29%, I, and again, I flagged those in red that were above 20% uh, of our respondents. About 29% uh, found that it instilled curiosity, which is great. Um, about almost 37% uh, said stress and anxiety. Uh, about 30% boredom, 36% uh, confidence, 20% uh, tiredness, and almost 40% said frustration. Looking at the uh, student feedback, um, because students, again, do their own self-survey, um, about 22% felt that it was uh, made them feel smart getting their homework done. About 44% said they were bored. About 24, 25% said they were frustrated. About 26% said they were annoyed. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and then we wanted to look at sleep as well. And again, we have lots of data, but I'm just giving you a quick tour today of some of the highlights that we've recently um, done. We looked at um, how much sleep does your child get for the parents, and does homework completion interfere with your child's ability to get a full night's rest? Um, the good news here is that the majority of the sample uh, almost 64% are getting, approximating more of that target age. Does anyone know for grades three to six, how many hours of sleep do students need to get? It's nine to 11. Nine to 11, nine to 11. that's the target. That's what the American um, Pediatric Association uh, recommends. Nine to 11 hours. So, I mean, it, it, it's, it's troublesome that, that you know, close to 30% are saying only seven to eight. Um, however, then we look down here and does homework interfere with amount of sleep? Um, only about 3.2% said yes, but about 18.1% said sometimes. So if we think about that, almost 20% or a little over 20% of our sample, um, for again, this is grades three to six, we're not talking high school. Grades three to six, about 20% of our sample said that sometimes or, or uh, yes, always or often, does homework interfere with um, sleep? Then we looked at, uh, for students, we asked the question, do you wish you got more sleep? 44% uh, said yes, and 33% said sometimes, so not a surprise there. But then we asked them, does homework interfere, homework completion interfere with sleep? And about 14% said yes, and about uh, almost 37% said sometimes. So again, uh, you know, an important um, thing to note. And uh, then we asked teachers, does the amount of sleep a student gets have an impact on academic performance? And uh, a whopping almost 68% said always. Always sleep impacts academic performance, which I, I, I completely concur with that. 
Um, and then 25% said often. So teachers seem to understand the importance of sleep. Um, I think though what we may need to do is to do a little more um, parent-teacher uh, collaboration around what, what factors may be impacting the sleep and if something such as a variable, such as homework, uh, something that is controllable, uh, might be able to be adjusted and, and supported also by the other research, then, um, then, then that's something to consider. So there are obviously limitations thus far to our study. We have a relatively small N. I mean, it's almost, it's about 900, but it's still small, so we're still wanting to grow that. We, we don't have a very representative sample. It's confined right now to only six schools in Northern California today, 28 classrooms. So uh, obviously we want to grow that eventually, and I'll show that on the next slide where we'd like to go with it. Um, primarily we have descriptive stats to date. Uh, we did just update all of our surveys, and um, thank you to uh, also Lisa Romero for taking a look at our surveys, and also James, my uh, stats. A uh, person now who has joined our research team, he's an undergraduate and um, is, is very savvy um, statistically. And so we have made adaptations based on feedback we've gotten in order to be able to heighten our um, ability to do more sophisticated, sophisticated statistics. And uh, obviously this is also perception research. Okay, so, so uh, you know, inherently there's challenges with uh, perception research. But future directions, again, we're currently collecting more data in San Juan Unified um, in grades three to six. The eventual goal would be to develop perhaps a website platform to where we could reach um, multiple schools and multiple districts nationally. Um, and uh, finding ways, I've been uh, having some meetings with uh, Pia Wong around that and just uh, finding ways of uh, best perhaps developing something like that that would make it more accessible to various districts and um, uh, more streamlined in the process. We want to eventually expand, expand our grades research. The reason why we focused on grades three to six is because that's really the grade where homework is least supported if we look at let's say middle schoolers and high schoolers there, there's some good correlation there um, well good better <laughs> correlation there between academic achievement and um, homework however in grades three to six the correlation is fairly weak to, to non-existent so we wanted to check that okay if we're doing this what 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 other factors might be involved then um, in the assignment of homework and the impact that might be having the other reason why we chose uh, third grade and up is because the students themselves can be uh, reporters. Uh, below third grade, self-report uh, measures are um, pretty unreliable. Uh, we're evolving our statistical procedures um, based, again, on a shift from using more categorical to quantitative items. Uh, eventually, we'll do some ANOVAs examining the rater status, parent, child, a teacher on a whole variety of variables that we're looking at. We're very excited. Some regression models to determine which variable have uh, the most value, value in predicting certain outcomes. So I wanted to leave you, and I know our, my time is short, but I, I just wanted to leave you with a few things if I can mushroom a little. Um, so tips for you all. Um, I do recommend helping as much as possible for students and their families to have balance, and I'll talk about what that means in just a minute. Working with students on coping strategies for stress, and then using advocacies in your school uh, based on what the research as a whole is telling us, and then also based on research that you yourselves can do, and, and I'm happy to help you launch some of this research in, into your own schools that you're working in, um, but, but based on um, your specific students, your specific schools to tailor uh, the practices in the classroom to best fit the population that you're working with. So in first looking at balance, I um, like to do this activity and, and we certainly don't have time today, but I'd like you to consider this. I, sometimes I give out a little paper plate and I have everyone kind of like a pie, a piece of pie. I want you to look at all of these and, and 
Think about this for yourselves outside of this room. I want you to think about all of these different um, things that you're engaged in, from meal preparation to eating, studying, maybe going to work, your hobbies, social time, technology, just driving time, grooming, getting up, showering, that type of thing in the morning. Look at all of those different activities. And then next to each activity, determine how much time you engage in all of those activities. I do this uh, activity in some workshops that I give, and also sometimes I do this activity with teens. What I find on average is that, how many hours do you think all of the teens' activities add up to? 32. <laughs> 32. <laughs> yeah. That's not far off, it's about 29. 29 hours. Are, wait, so are there 29 hours in a day? <laughs> no. It's not possible. Um, and so where do you think the time is being stolen from? Sleep. sleep. That's one of the primary areas, sleep. Students just sleep less, and they, they cram these other things in. Um, so create goals for balance. I encourage you all to take the challenge. Add up your hours, and then determine what's being stolen. Am I eating? take out in the car as I'm driving somewhere? Is, is it stealing away from my nutritional, like taking care of myself? Do I decide not to take my run or my walk that day? Um, what, what's, what, where am I stealing time from? Um, and then make the, uh, make the challenge um, to be balanced. And then, and then I find for myself, the more that I can practice something in my own life, the better able I'm able to take that into my work with the students that I teach and also the students, the children that I serve. Um, too extracurricular or not too extracurricular? I have this conversation a lot with parents. Um, really be thoughtful about the extracurriculars that your kids are doing. Is it primarily just to build a resume for college? Because really, oftentimes, if that's the case, it just starts to, to, to squeeze all the nectar out of the high school experience, out of the childhood experience. Manage your priorities and prioritize health. And really, sleep is so impactful. There, there was this research study that recently came out where they kept uh, a group up um, and, and only allowed them to sleep for a few hours. And then um, the, the other group uh, all became inebriated, and then they did a variety of um, tasks with them. Guess who fared better? <laughs> the drunk people. <laughs> I tell you what, if I had to be in that study, I know which, uh, <laughs> which section I want to be in. <laughs> OK. Um, stress management. How many of you reckon, or, uh, remember the yurks dodson law? Yeah, from, from undergrad. Remember this? <laughs> uh, where uh, low arousal oftentimes creates low performance. How, um, how much effort do you put into something that's automatic? Not much, right? So a little bit of arousal, a little bit of stress, a little bit of challenge and demand increases arousal, increases performance, However, there's a tipping point. There's a point where optimal performance and optimal arousal come together and then it drops off. And we actually end up with impaired performance because of strong anxiety. Now there's a variety of reasons for that. Um, just off the uh, top of your heads, with regard to when an organism is really under stress, does anyone know one of the areas of the brain that goes offline? The hippocampus, what does the hippocampus do? It's the house of memory. The hippocampus is the house of memory. So if we want students to really be engaged and performing well, the hippocampus is pretty important. What's the other area of the brain that goes offline during um, when, when an organism is stressed? The prefrontal lobes organization, planning, right? Thoughtful decision making. So if the areas when we are under stress 
Uh, and too much stress, I'm talking about over in this section here, so when, when you're really flooded with stress, if your memory goes offline and your ability to plan and execute thoughtful decisions goes offline, um, how big a student are you gonna be? <laughs> what turns on is what's called the amygdala, which is that fight, flight, or flee. Have you ever had this experience where you study, 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 or, or you think, okay, I have that talk down, I'm gonna do really well at that public speaking event. And then you get up there and you flood. Have you ever had that experience where your mouth goes dry and you think, I can't remember a thing that I was supposed to, to just talk about? Or, or, oh my God, I don't recognize any of these questions on that test. That's, that's what's happening. So what do we need to do for our students? To help them to reactivate that parasympathetic nervous system, to come back to decrease that stress and be able to have them reground. So the, I just have a few tips uh, for how uh, children can help to manage stress. Uh, exercise oftentimes is lacking for, for the kids that we serve. Just talking with friends, music, taking breaks, self-reinforcement. Kids aren't very good at uh, doing little reinforcements along the way for themselves, so taking break and breaks and reinforcing themselves. Cognitive work, I won't go into that much right now, but just having some thought replacement with um, healthier thoughts about themselves and who they are. Um, obviously seeing a professional. And then I added mindfulness. So I'm just gonna take everyone through just a, a quick breathing activity, it won't take long, but just to kind of have that experience for all of us. So get as comfortable as you can in your heart back chair.
be okay with small changes. You know, think about what your schools are doing right now. I know right now um, that there's a movement toward even later start times, which I think is so helpful, particularly in the high school years when um, students' circadian rhythms anyways shift to where sleepiness doesn't even really happen until about 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night, and then if we're expecting them to get up for these zero periods, that really creates a very tenuous learning environment for our students. Solutions may look different for every grade level. Um, here's just a few ideas. Um, really deciding, um, based on the homework, uh, how much, if, if any homework ought to be assigned, what the purpose of that work is, and then setting limits on the time. Uh, he's saying, boy, another load of homework tonight, we need a stronger lobby in Congress. <laughs> <laughs> so join the efforts, participate in research. Here's the uh, sign up for the Race to Nowhere. It's at www.racetonowhere.com. Vicki Inglis has lots of great resources. There's um, terrific videos um, on the topic of looking uh, at the subject. And so there's my contact information. If anybody has questions that we're not able to get to right now in our time, because I know we just have about five minutes left, um, feel free to email me. That's my information there. And I'll look at Holland at csus.edu.